Hello, everyone, and welcome to our, our Fallout 76 uh, dev dive for Fallout for Hope. Um, we're here with uh, Carl McEvitt, Senior Quest Designer for Bethesda Game Studios, and Jonathan Rush, Art Director for Bethesda Game Studios. Uh, and as always, my amazing co-host, Tom from the Fallout Lorecast. Hey, guys. Welcome. We're uh, tonight. We're going to be doing the new event, which, if you haven't had a chance to do that yet, Carl is going to be walking us through and, and guiding us uh, through becoming cultists and and defending the great Mothid one, and uh, that'll be kicking off here in about sixty seconds at the top of the hour. It'll be starting, and uh, Carl, as as we get ready, do you want to talk a little bit about the the new event? I can't guide you to become a cultist. I can only show you the truth and let you guide yourself. Um, but that aside, I will also show you how this event works. Um, this event takes place in Point Pleasant, um, which is the home of the Mothman. And it involves a new faction that uh, we have added to the game, which is kind of a sub-faction of an existing one, the Mothman Cultists, which I'm sure most players are familiar with as the creepy guys uh, who have various cultist camps throughout the area. Uh, but the Wise Mothman's Enlightened, they're a new group. Uh, they are focused on the wa Wise Mothman himself, that one single guy who has the kind of pinkish-purplish eyes who appears currently during... Oh, Mothman's up! Oh, yeah. uh, who appears during the Equinox... Or, I'm sorry, during the Path to Enlightenment event. Uh, this is when he's at the height of his power, and the Wise Mothman's Enlightened are his followers. Uh, so we should probably get down to the town and actually succeed at this event because it'd be a real bummer to fail it <laughs> on a live stream. <laughs> <laughs> We've got enough of us here. Why don't we uh why don't we do introductions all around for uh, the teammates that are supporting us today? We got uh Tonic, say hello. Howdy everybody. We also have uh no respawns in chat with us. Oi oi everyone, oi oi. We have from Bethesda UK, Rob Vault of Daedalus. Hello there. We also have uh, Bethesda moderator slash <laughs> Loopy, whatever your title is, I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, ambassador. Volunteer moderator. That volunteer yeah, moderator. An, an ambassador. Um, hello. Hi. Speak with me. And uh, last but not least, Waterfalls. From the follow for Hope staff. Thank you for having me. This little uh, roof shrine is amazing. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's uh, very impressive for sure. I'm getting big Mama Murphy vibes out of the blind wise Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Children, listen well. Three piles have been placed throughout the wise one's home. <laughs> Their light is a vital catalyst to our ritual. The dim ones have attempted to contain our light. Destroy their vines encircling each pyre before we proceed. I'm also getting um, Skyrim Jarl vibes out of the, uh, the way you sit in the throne. Vines have been destroyed. Will the observers instruct you on your next turn? Early now. Children, his patience does not run as deep as his wisdom. Yeah, funny thing with the throne, uh, we had a we had a bug fix where originally in the throne you were trying to place your hand on on a skull, which is normally there for the grognock uh, the uh, the grognock throne, and uh, there was just this awkward hand sitting up on top of nothing when we first implemented it. <laughs> Uh, so the character who just talked, that is Interpreter Clarence. He is the uh, somewhat of a leader um, of the Wise Mothman's Enlightened. Uh, he's certainly the leader of this group that came out here. Uh, but there are interpreters within their ranks, and there are observers. And we'll see a few of them scattered throughout. Um, but generally speaking, they see their role as interpreting the Wise Mothman, not necessarily speaking on his behalf or worshiping him it's more of an observation and interpretation they see themselves as a little bit more scientific um and uh calculated than the other uh cultists in the game 
Um, we use the, the term a lot that they don't see themselves as wizards. They see themselves as alchemists. I hope that makes sense to some people. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I love uh, interpreter Clarence's voice is awesome. It's very Vincent Price-like. I love how deep and creepy it is. Yes, that was a definite point of inspiration. Um, and the, the voice actor on that just killed it. Uh, sometimes you go into a session wondering if they're going to think you're a psychopath at the end, which he still may have. Um, <laughs> but he played along very well and did an awesome job. These albino red, red stags are pretty creepy, too. Yeah. The blood trough. That's a nice touch. <laughs> uh, Carl, do you normally... Uh... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. I was just saying, I love everybody's Mothman appropriate attire. Don't pay attention to my brotherhood of steel cloak. Definitely not wearing the wrong outfit. <laughs> I had to ruin it for everyone, honestly. Sorry. Well, we need a human sacrifice, so it's okay. This is true, and I'm happy to oblige. <laughs> I, I gotta, wouldn't let the team down a second time. Now, Carl, do you normally get a chance to, to sit in on, on voiceover sessions while you're recording? Or is, was this oh, yeah. something you've done for the first time? Uh, no, we. So it's it really comes down to to um, the scope of the work you're doing, how much is going in. We tend to uh, do content where individual quest designers get to spend a lot of time uh, on their content. So we all tend to join those voice sessions, and they are a ton of fun. It's one of my favorite parts of the job. Um, you get to work with. Uh, you know, actors who played characters that you love from previous games, and you get to you know spin up brand new ideas with them. It's it's really great, um, and they bring so much to it. It's like you start with a script, and you think a character is going to sound a certain way, and they just they reinvent it and they bring life to it. It's it's a great process. Yeah, I had a chance to take uh, Wes Johnson's voice acting class, and it was awesome to hear how that process really works. Um, a lot of the times, he said the the script is really open to interpretations and sometimes they come up with character constructs or a voice that really surprises people but just happens oh, for sure yeah to, to really suit the character yeah oh so uh yeah now we're tripping out on moth dust oh <laughs> this, this is, is wild crazy. the um with headphones the voice just like transitioned like into your head this is quite cool <laughs> what so you guys are all just like blowing everything up with your miniguns and I'm just punching everybody. <laughs> That's a valid play style, Tom. I'm just trying to run up and punch things as best I can. It's my gladiator build. Uh, so some helpful tips here hopefully uh is that during this defense wave it'll start at the church and then the bridge will come under attack but unlike other um defense things that we have uh we're not you're not moving between the bonfires rather we're adding to the scope of what you need to protect each time so uh, once the bridge comes under attack make sure you don't abandon the church entirely because uh they will keep spawning and they will keep attacking it and same goes for when the water side goes under attack as well i'll hold down the church i'm going to the bridge now so am i oh that's a big death claw oh you leave my fire. Oh, good lord. Hello. <laughs> I'm a Hello, Trico. Helps. No, it's fine. Oh, he died just as I got here. <laughs> you were there in spirit. It's fine. What's this going over here? Oh, Cultist Destroyer. Yeah, so there's another tip. Um, only the, the cultists labeled as Destroyer will attack the, the Pyres. Um, the Ooh. other ones will go directly for the players. Uh, we, you must protect it. <laughs> this is a very cool. His voice is just so unsettling right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a, it's like a chorus or flanger filter thing going on. Right, I'll stay by the bridge oh. and hold the fort here. Be gone, fake Mothman. 
Oh, hello, Treacle. Oi, where are you? Um, so the number of pyres that you can keep up by the end will actually determine uh, the chance of getting one of the rare rewards. So, um, you know, try to keep them all going. Get yeah. the good oh, stuff. Oh, there's a vengeful moth man here. Where is he? I like that there are just cultists, like, just chilling out, worshipping while we're killing stuff. Vibing. And I respect that. Yeah. They got their candles. It takes great concentration to summon the wise one. So what are these sacred books over here? I haven't seen these before. Oh. I don't know. I've <laughs> never heard of those. You're a liar! <laughs> oh, good lord. So, fun note on those sacred books, actually, um, which I'll let players discover a little bit more about them themselves, but uh, they were written by another quest designer, Josh, um, who also wrote a certain character uh, from Steel Rain. I don't want to spoil who, but let's say a central antagonist uh, of it. And so the the verbose and uh, very complex wording of some of those uh, tomes, I think that his, his, uh, his writing style translated really well there. Um, and in order to kind of build out this idea of um, characters who are kind of worshipping sacred texts, I had tried to have as little involvement in that as possible to kind of have it get this feel of, uh, you know, their their scripture basically being external to the characters that are here. So they're, they're kind of following the words as they went down. And uh, I think they came out pretty crazy. If this is the first time we've encountered them. Where where did they come from? Why did they come here? The enlightened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're they're here to uh, worship during the equinox at the Mothman's uh, the Wise Mothman's birthplace, which is Point Pleasant. So um, they live in a far away area. Actually, hold on. I'll I'll let the Wise Mothman show up first, and then I'll I'll talk. It's an epic moment when he arrives. Let us pray. I like this part. This part's cool. <laughs> oh, <laughs> snap. <laughs> Magnificent. <laughs> That's awesome. Make sure you interact with him to get your, uh, your buff. Oh, I got a cultist enlightened robe. Oh, I'm so enlightened. Oh, lucky. Oh, I got the hood. Oh, I got a throne. Oh, I got the majestic helmet. You got the throne. Ah, oh, get, get in. Let's see what I got here. I feel enlightened by the presence of the Mothman. Ah, oh, oh. look at him. I got the beer stein. Oh, nice. You should totally get like a team photo in front of him. Yeah, I got a beer stein too. Oh, I got the beer stein as well. Nice. Uh, yeah, I think everybody should get that on their first completion of the event. The beer stein. So. In addition to whatever rewards you normally get. Yeah, the sky yeah, change so line is, is really cool. Yeah, and that'll stick around for about, I think, 15 minutes after the... Uh, it might be 10 minutes after the end of the event. Um, so you can get all your selfies in with the Mothman. And what, while you can interact with him, even if you didn't complete the event, um, only if you were present during it can you get the buff. What's the buff again, Coral? What's it do? <laughs> yeah, it's a 15% um, uh, increase to experience gained for one hour. You zoom up close, he's actually a bit grim. <laughs> he is. He's a bit he's a bit scaly, isn't he? Um that's a bit of You know what? You know what Yoda was no looker and he was pretty wise. I'm just saying This is this is very true. This is very true. <laughs> Although maybe next time Mothman needs a bit of SPF. Um, it's all I'm saying. I don't think he bathes very often. Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, we'll be doing the lore in a moment here when we switch to interview. We just wanted to start with the event at the top of the hour here. Oh, you can send in him. Oh, ooh. 
<laughs> it's a bit squelchy in there. Do not enter the Mothman. <laughs> I've been inside. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so I was mentioning that they um they don't they are not natives to Appalachia. So when the equinox is over, they will go back to their home. Uh, they live in a place called the Lantern, which we're we're not saying too much about yet, but uh, it is away from here. We can say that. Mm. 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 Right, I'm going to stop nubbing around then. Right. right, I need to grind this. This happens at the up at top of every hour, correct? Yep. Every hour. Oh, I'm going to be... Same for Fashion Act. So I'm going to be grinding out all the stuff. Well, let's... Uh... Yeah, thanks very much to uh, to all of the people who helped us complete this event. Uh, Loopy, No Respawns, Paternalis Falls, Tonic, and uh, Vault of Daedalus. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having us. So yeah. Let's, uh, let's uh, hop out and switch here. Are we all jumping out of the game? We are. All right. There we go. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. This is the first time I played it. I I actually don't like playing on PTS because I hate spoilers. <laughs> Me too. Me too. I usually wait until things are actually out and official because I, I want to feel like when I'm doing stuff, it's like it actually counts, you know, but that was that was super cool. And I've I've if anybody's listened to any of my stuff, you guys know that I'm a big fan of it, all the creepy things. And this definitely counts. And so I'm loving it. Very, very cool stuff, guys. Um, man, so I guess we we can start with the the questions, Ken. Yeah, let's, we're doing it. Shall we kick so, off with uh, your robots dozen here? Yeah, well, why don't why don't we reintroduce everybody? Because this part is going to go up on um, on the podcast, and this is going to be kind of uh, you know audio uh, audio food for our ears. Audio food. Why don't we just call it that? So let's in reintroduce everybody. So uh, I'm Tom or Robots, and this is Ken from the Chad Fallout seventy six podcast, and we both are on the Fallout Hub. And so welcome, everybody. And um, we are here with some very special guests today. Senior Quest designer uh, Carl McKevitt and art director John Rush from Fault 76. Welcome, guys. Hello. Thanks for having us. Thank you yeah. for having us. Thank you for taking the time to join us today um, to answer some questions. It is always exciting for both Ken and I to get to talk to you guys. Big fans of all of your work and uh i know that you don't always get the time i know you guys are very busy um to be able to answer questions about the games that you work on uh, but thank you for taking that time to talk with us um yeah, of course we like to start out our interviews with some some quick uh questions this is the robots dozen don't think too hard about these these are meant to be just quick top of mind loosen the loosen you up just kind of throw out the first thing that comes to mind and these are supposed to be real fast because we want to no, get no. real juicy stuff. So we're going to go back and forth. We're going to start with Carl. The first question is ready. Mm -hmm. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Freezing things, freezing <laughs> things. I don't know why Carl is wow, an immediate is... villain. <laughs> like, or like Iceman. Yeah. I, Iceman's goodish uh, guy. So, yeah. yeah, he started out, he started out mostly good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like cryo, cryo Carl. They, yeah, it's it's yeah, it is my uh, my attraction towards wordplay like that. I like it. I like it. All right, let's move over to John. John, where would you go if I was to just all of a sudden give you a time machine? Oh, uh, boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, where would I go if you gave me a time machine? Right. First thing. I I think I'd have to go back to the, the the times of the the knights knights and castles and damsels in distress. Nice medieval Europe. Yeah, any, there you go. Any specific country? Hmm, a 
have to go with uh, go with Scotland. Scotland. Go over to, to Scotland. Man, everyone would look at you like, what are you talking about? And every other <laughs> word they wouldn't understand. That would be amazing. Exactly. That would be so. That would be so cool. And then you'd get like burned at the stake. They think you're like a witch or something. That would be great. That would be great. <laughs> I was say there's there's plagues and yeah. inquisitions and those sorts of things. Yeah, but right, right. it'll be all right. Yeah, he's just be visiting. Just be visiting the place. You know. <laughs> all right, back to Carl. What is your favorite quote? Oh no, <laughs> that's your favorite quote. That's a great one. It is now. <laughs> I. T- uh, uh, it is a quote from my wife on this post-it note that says, "P.S. Do your time cards." That's my favorite quote. <laughs> your favorite quote. That's hey, I'm an adult and I need to be reminded to fill out time cards. Hey, it's going to keep you out of trouble. So yeah. right now, that makes sense to be your favorite quote. I like that. All right, John, hmm. is there intelligent life out in the universe? Absolutely. That Looking was out. boom. Yeah. All right. Uh, back to Carl. What would you? How would you get an elephant into a refrigerator? A hacksaw. That's the messy way to do it. <laughs> Carl, what is going on what? there with the ice <laughs> and the murdering of an elephant with a hacksaw? <laughs> I mean, the ice powers would probably make it a little bit easier to break apart. So maybe I should have said sledgehammer. That would have. Oh man. That would have helped. Is that even, is that better? Oh, uh, more convenient. Cultists are starting to kind of get to him a bit. I think he's kind of freezing real hard, and then you just like whack off all the limbs with a sledgehammer, and then they just crack. Right? That's how you do it. Off all the pieces in the refrigerator. I can see where you go. All right, John. What three items would you take to a desert island other than food and water? Three items would I take other than food and water? Well, you got you have to have cigar. Okay. You have, you have to have a lighter for the cigar, of course. There you go. All right. Um, I'd probably bring. Uh, well, I'd probably bring a, a, a solar powered fan. All right. All right. Cigar, lighter, fan, Ooh, solar powered. Solar powered fan. Very important. Solar powered fan. Right. Right. Yeah. No electric outlets. On the Obviously. Obviously, and then food and water. I okay. thought maybe you're going to go with like bourbon and just kind of be like <laughs> living the life. Yeah. Now he's regretting his choices. <laughs> yeah, now, now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> All right. Well, you're going to be <laughs> limited up on that on that island. Um, All right. Let's go back to Carl. Carl, why are manhole covers round? Um. <laughs> uh, let's see. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to the car. This is called dead air. Yes, this is this is. Uh, I've I've never been more perplexed by a question. Because they're not, they're not square. Well, because that's they're not. They're squ- squ- yeah, that was the first thing. I, but it it wasn't a satisfying answer. <laughs> um, I mean, nope, people nope, oh, nope, nope, got nothing. Round, sorry. No, no answer. There's no, no good answer. answer. There's no, there is no good answer for why. The answer is that there is no good answer. Yes. All right. All right. Now, um, Ken, uh, you wrote this one. Is the, the first word on this one supposed to be who? No, it should be how. Okay. All right. So I was wondering about that because it, it didn't make sense to me, but I didn't know if maybe you're just going, getting weird with this one. Um, how would you title your autobiography? You can see why who would be weird on that one. Uh, John? For me, how, how would you title it? How would you title your autobiography? How would I title my autobiography? Hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, like you have an answer. Did you just laugh at your own answer? Before yeah, giving it? You went into your mind palace to review different ideas. And... How would I title my autobiography? Boy, I don't know, man. He does know. He just can't share it. That's a great one. I don't know, man. For some suggestions, I think. Calling a friend. Uh, Calling a friend. That's that's a viable option. Let's go with the um, the better half of Tucker and Rush. Oh, a, a story of music. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate that. 
Uh, <laughs> some inside story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So our our uh, our director is Mark Tucker, uh, oh, yeah. who works uh, in collaboration with Mr. Rush pretty often, and they have a uh, band who I've yet to see perform, though I believe that they did during a company talent show. Uh, Tucker and Rush. You guys did do something, right? You. Uh, oh, it's it's actually it's Rush and Tucker. It is not Rush and, Rush and Tucker. Tucker. It is. Oh no! It is absolutely we've, Tucker and Rush. We've, we've kind of gone the way of logins and Messina. It's like, well, who's Messina? He used to, put, you know, that's kind mm-hmm. of Tucker. Mm-hmm. He's had his diva moments, you know, and it was just time for us to part ways. But Oxygen <laughs> Network is doing a, uh, a uh, kind of a documentary <laughs> on us, sort of like the Beatles, the you know, except they're. Uh, you know, it's 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 certainly not one sided. It's directed by me, but it, it kind of shows. It's called Get Out. It's not Get Back. It's Get Out. It's a little bit. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so much for really quick answers. <laughs> oh yeah. Probably. <laughs> Thank you a bit. Oh, isn't even the best drummer in the Beatles. All right. How about how about we go back to Carl? Carl, cat or dog? Dog. Always dog. That is the right answer. <laughs> John. What do you think of garden gnomes? I'm in favor of garden gnomes. What was that? I'm in favor of garden gnomes. I think I think garden gnomes would make excellent turrets. <laughs> that <laughs> would actually be hilarious if they were secret ones where their mouth would just drop open and. Uh... Well, I just know what I, I want sure? to recommend for the Adam Shop now. Shop. <laughs> <laughs> Carl's making notes. <laughs> their their mouths open like um. Like uh, like the little Nutcracker guys for like yeah, holiday, exactly. nights. their mouths go, Wah! and then there's like a little gun turret that goes Wah! out Just of like, them. Like the yeah. Robin Williams movie Toys. Do you remember that little doll walking along the hallway and then like the she yeah, came out of her mouth, comes out and then they just go. Hard gnomes are like they're like Smurf mannequins. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's a garden gnome. Yes, I like it. All right, Carl. Last question: Killer, mm-hmm. Brotherhood, or Raider? I'd say settler. Settler. I'm a I'm a pretty na, nonviolent kind of guy. You're yeah, that's the impression we've gotten with you chopping up frozen elephants. Nobody said. <laughs> nobody said the elephant was still alive. I just want to say it, it may have been a butcher situation. I had to deal. You know. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, that seems pretty raider to me. So you say what you want, but I think we know the real answer here. Okay, Settler, who is a low-key raider, um, <laughs> secretly planning to uh, lead an invasion. We'll go with that. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, here, I'm, I'm going to alter this last one just, uh, just a hair to make it more Fallout-centric. John, money is no object. You have all the caps that you could possibly have. And tomorrow you could do anything you want. And you're in the wasteland. What do you do? What do I do with all the caps in the wasteland? I give it to somebody who just came out of the vault. Aww. 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 I see, Carl. Now, John, that's a real settler type. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah, Sorry, yeah I'll, I'll kill the player that he gave the caps to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the caps from his land. Shove them in the refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> It's the strangest right. thing. The body was found in a fridge, uh, frozen and chopped up into pieces. <laughs> yeah. And yet the fridge wasn't plugged in. How did it freeze? <laughs> we'll never know. A powered fridge, obviously. Carl. It was, it was solar powered. There was a solar powered fan in the fridge. Yeah, exactly. And they found, <laughs> they found a cigar sitting on the corner of the fridge for some reason. So it all connects back. Who left the cigar? Storytelling. All right. Thank you for answering the robots dozen questions. You are now officially part of the show, and we also have a readout here. Let me uh, pull this up. All right, we um, you've secretly taken your vats, uh, and it is telling me now, Carl, that you are a uh, you're set up to be a professional dog walker. Congratulations! Your yeah, dog- it's a, the goat. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, your goat. Uh, that's uh, your that dog- was that that was to trick me, right? That was. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of it. Yes, uh, your goat. Yes, and uh, you're a professional dog walker. And John, it says that you are a. Um, is this right? A Republican politician. <laughs> <laughs> that's 
uh, that's what the goat says. But welcome to the show, and uh, let's uh, let's get let's get on with some questions. So first of all, let's let's get into a little bit of your background, Carl. How did you get started with gaming? Um, it's gonna sound like a joke, but it's not. <laughs> um, actually, I so I learned Korean. Um, and uh, by knowing Korean, I was able to get a job writing a summary uh, on a Korean MMO game that a company was considering to bring over here. They needed somebody who had some game design background. I, coming out of college, I had game design as my background. And they needed somebody who could actually play this game in Korean, um, which I, I did. I wrote up a 60-page document. That person immediately left the company, never reading it, uh, wow. but brought me to their next job. And then it was a long string of uh of opportunities after that so a little bit of luck and a little bit of knowledge of a foreign language that was uh that's how i broke in wow that's a that's a really roundabout way to do it that's like that's crazy crazy now john how did you get started in in gaming and in, in the industry yeah so I think I think like probably all of us here. I've, I've played games since I was just a little kid, all the way back to I'm about to age myself, all the way back to the Atari. You know, beating my dad at Donkey Kong, and uh, you know, it's just playing them all through high school and through some of college and towards the end of college. You know, I was studying I was studying studio art, and I was kind of wondering what I was going to do with that degree, maybe teach or, or something. And uh, I started to notice like a lot of the similarities in how the art for games was made, uh, weighed against what I was what I was doing in school. And so, just uh, they just kind of fit together. And I thought, well, this is this is something I absolutely have to do. So spent spent about a year or so learning the software. It wasn't taught at my school at the time. There wasn't much much online about it so a lot of trial and error and then ended up sending out about 100 emails hey hire me uh, and eventually somebody said yes so that's all it took was one person to say yes and there i am wow wow that's cool that's that's really neat now um now for each of you and we'll go back to carl on this one when did you first discover fallout it is something I was aware of. I was not a, and this is sacrilegious to say, I was not a PC gamer growing up. <gasps> um, so I'm sorry. So uh, in fact, I had bought Morrowind um, for the PC and was unable to play it because my PC was not powerful enough. Uh, so I had to wait years for the, or a year or two, I guess, until the Xbox version came out uh, and I played on there. That was my introduction into the Elder Scrolls and Greater Bethesda family, but for the the older versions, that was a thing I saw in magazines, and I was like, "That looks cool." I'll I'll never be able to play that. Um, so going into Fallout Three was kind of my opportunity to say, "Hey, this is made by a studio that I love. It's a property I've heard of. Super exciting." Um, I got you know pre ordered the special edition with the lunchbox, um, which I had Todd Howard and Emil both sign. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And had to sneak back into the office to get it back before somebody stole it because, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was kind of, I, I kind of came from it at an almost at an Elder Scrolls angle where I was a big fan of Elder Scrolls and I was, and the Bethesda by extension. And so I just kind of said, I trust that if they think this was a really cool property, that I'm also going to love this property. And sure enough, I did. Now, what, what do you specifically love? about fallout like what it what what about it made you kind of fall in love with it i think there's just something about the aesthetic this um it is the future but it's also not the future it is a nostalgia for a thing that has never actually existed before um i'm a big fan of uh stuff from the the 1950s 1960s time period uh, even newer stuff that's set in that like mad men as an example um so I, that i've always kind of enjoyed that vibe and having a unique spin on it of it's both the future and it's futuristic technology but it's also from that time and then the apocalypse it's all just kind of it, it's such a unique setting that like you know there's nothing else really like it yeah john yeah. what about you well i mean it, i i had played fallout since since the series began but i think i think when it really kind of sank its teeth into me was with with three um three and of course four uh you know just being drawn to i love the open exploration exploring all the little details of the world taking the time to read through the terminals and the stories and sort of piecing together 
uh, piecing together everything that happened. Um, I love that contrast between the, 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 the 1950s feel plus that, you know, apocalyptic wasteland um, and trying to find the sweet spot in between the two. I think Fallout's always done a fantastic job with that. Yeah. It's also a great space for humor. Um, it's, a, it's a game that can get very dark. It can get very serious, cover some uh, really serious themes, but it also never takes itself seriously enough that it can't have fun with it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I always enjoy that. And I think in a lot of my quests, they can get a little bit wacky. Um, but that's also, you know, it's one of my favorite parts of the series. Right. Yeah. Ken and I talk a lot about this, how uh, Fallout can hit both extremes. It can both be very dark and very serious. And it talks about like the deepest, darkest sides of humanity. But it can also be super silly and super wacky at the same time. Like and, and and in some ways, that's the way we as humans deal with those dark things, is is with humor. Um, so it it runs that whole spectrum, which is part of what's so interesting and enjoyable about about the Fallout series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say, I, I was fortunate that um, I you know I only joined the company back in 2018, so I came in as a fan. Um, so it's really it, it's been pretty thrilling to be able to to write for that really unique setting um that i literally couldn't write about that setting anywhere but here so it's uh, worked out pretty well so do yeah the still, setting is a big deal do you still have moments where because you've been such a fan you you walk into the office and you're just like this is this is real this is my life. yeah this no is and all, all the time there are surreal moments of like i can't believe i just witnessed that or was a part of that and I can't tell you about any of it, but it is one surreal, awesome moment after another, for sure. So, Carl, how would you how would you explain what what exactly is quest design to you? Like sure. when you when you take that on, like what what is that? Uh, it is a position that's very different at various companies. Um, for in in some places, quest designer just means writer. Um, you are writing the quest structure. Uh, and, you know, there is somebody who will implement that content. In some cases, it is just the implementer. It's somebody uh, who has a team of writers who's, who writes what the content will be and the dialogue, and they implement that vision of it. At Bethesda, we have a, uh, we call it kind of a unicorn in terms of the, the skill set. It's a combination of both creating the content and writing the content at the same time. Um, and it is, it's really challenging. Um, but it's uh it's also it's super rewarding as well but it, just in terms of what we do for the games that uh everybody plays uh if it is a quest that appears in your pit boy uh either a quest designer or a level designer has put that in um for most of what's in 76 especially the main quests um and really anything that has a lot of dialogue in it uh a quest designer is the person who uh put all the steps in that the player has to do to uh, complete that quest and wrote all the dialogue for it um, and also coordinated with the other teams on creating the rewards the the looks for the NPCs all those sorts of things everything is super uh, collaborative but it's a uh, we're kind of the person who who puts in uh, every step of the way to get from the quest to beginning to end so how does that relate to level design like, what's the distinction there? Uh, it, it depends on if we're planning to build content for an area that has already uh, been designed. Sometimes a dungeon has been created as just an exploration space, and later we decide, hey, we want to put a story in there. Or if it's a story uh, that is taking place in a new space. So Steel Rain is a good example. Uh, Harper's Ferry um, train tunnel, that was a new space. Uh, that was a huge effort by level design, by art very collaborative to kind of uh, both first come up with what happens down there, but then also build the space around it. So that in that case, it, it is a hand in hand, every step along the way, quest level design and arts working together. Um, in other cases, quest designs coming into a space that level has already created. Um, and it's more of a talking with them about the space and any improvements you can make. Um, but it sometimes, you know, it really just depends on the context. Makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. So, um, so in quest design, you you also get involved with the writing and the scripting. Like, is that part of your role? Yes. Um, I I won't 
take any credit as the greatest scripter on the planet. Um, but it is, it is something that we are in charge of. Um, we have, you know, engineers who help us out and that sort of thing. But, uh, in, when it comes to quest design, we often, uh, have to make our bed and then lie in it when it comes to that work. So, uh, if we have a really ambitious, cool idea for something that the player does along the way, um, you know, it takes, uh, it's a team effort, but it comes down to us to try to try to actually implement that content. In a way, yeah. it's, it's it's almost like your your director of like a, a mini play or like like almost like a mini anthology in that you're you're mm -hmm. directing, you're writing, you're coordinating with different teams. Even though in title, that's it means something very different in game design. It's kind of what you do. Yeah, it can it can feel that way for sure. Sometimes we are, um, I'd say, a member of the band, uh, and you especially if we're, we're writing uh, for content that is a system or outside of. Um, you know, a straight quest or something like that. But when it comes to a quest itself, we often have to kind of um, carry the torch on what that content is because everybody has so much work to do all the time that, you know, you've got to basically be the person who's got the eye on your quest to make sure everything's getting done there for it. Yeah, so um, Fallout 76, being that it is a multiplayer version of Fallout, there's in creating these story quests, I'm sure there are some differences between creating a quest in Fallout 76 as opposed to creating something for just a, a fully single player game. Even though you can go through those storylines single player, yeah, for sure. Can you talk about the differences between creating like a quest line for a fully single player game versus 76? Mm -hmm. Because like it, it, it is different and. This is one of those things that, like, as a player, I I can feel that it's a little bit different. But to me, I can just jump in to play it. Right. But from your perspective, I'm sure it's it's a much bigger thing than we would we would understand as players. Yeah, and I can, I can really only speak to my own uh, experience because um, you know it, it's a large team that, that built the quests that are in there. Um, but and a lot of consideration goes into each of them. But for the quests that I have worked on personally, um, one of the big factors to, that always has to be kept in mind is that there's only so much um, impact that we can allow the player to really do before we start to make um, it difficult for the future uh, moving forward. So there's only you know we we can't as an example allow the player to nuke. Well, <laughs> that's not true. They could nuke a place, but to, to nuke away in uh, the way that uh, in at the beginning at Fallout Three in the Ten Penny Tower, you know, you can destroy a megaton, and that makes a permanent crater in the world. Those are those are the types of impacts we really can't pursue. So we try to find ways to make the story more meaningful to the player on a personal level, and not necessarily on a massive environmental way. Um, that said, I, I feel like the the um, that restriction in mind hasn't really changed many of the ideas that we want to do when it comes to storytelling. Um, you know, 76, I feel like has really let us craft the stories we wanted to tell. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's always a consideration in the back of our heads that like, we got to remember that this is a world full of players who are also on their own adventures. Um, we want them to feel like they're making significant choices. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we've got to, we've also got to keep the, the fabric of the universe of 76 in one piece for all the different players that are in it. Yeah, that's interesting because there's the distinctions between the things that affect everybody and the things that affect you and your emotional relationships with certain characters are definitely things that are more focused on you than necessarily other people. Whereas, you know, if all of a sudden, uh, you know, a certain part of the map just disappeared, it, you couldn't necessarily implement, implement that for everyone. So, so that makes right. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Now the um, uh, the Red Rocket Collectron was something that that you contributed to in terms of design and dialogue. Did the design of him come from any particular source? And in a way, he's a lot like very nineteen fifties sci fi comic. Uh, I'll let I'll let John take that one. Yeah. So there was. Uh, so I'm not sure who the original artist was. It was one of the concept artists, I believe, for Fallout Four. Had painted out this robot, just like a waist up. For a red rocket commercial and i think it was hanging up by our coffee machine in the office or something i was like you know that would make a really cool collector <laughs> so 
Like you know, let's 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 flesh out the rest of it. So you know, drew out we uh, concepted out the 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 rest of the the collectron had that built out and collaborated with with animation and and with design on what type of personality this this uh, character would have, how it recharges, right? How it goes up to the 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 kind of red rocket station and then it plugs itself back in and the head sort of bobs up and down. The and, animation yeah. of that is so cool. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, kind of, kind of inspired by an idea from from art that had been done internally for for a previous iteration of, of Fallout, and then you know, express that idea to the different disciplines, and everybody just kind of gets together, and and there you go. Periodically, because I mean, Fallout has been cranking on for a long time now. Every now and then, do you do you take a look back or, or happen to see something that was maybe an early concept sketch or from a previous game? You think. What if we could? What if we could bring this into seventy six? All the time, absolutely, yeah. So something I've noticed uh, in the game industry from working on other games is that it's always good to, especially on games as a service, right? That continue on and continue on. It's always good to go back and 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 look at where it started, right? To see to see if you veered too far away from what what the original uh, vision of the of the title was, or or if there's room to expand on that anymore. So yeah, I mean, constantly, we've got a, a great library of, of, of past concept for Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, and it's always good to go through and look at that, see what people were thinking, even stuff that wasn't used, especially stuff that wasn't used. There's there's always little ideas like lurking in, in, in the corners of, uh, of these concepts that, that prompt new ideas that That's are very awesome. relevant to the game, yeah. It's a nice bit of continuity and a little bit of nostalgia too. Yeah, it's really important. And there's kind of a sort of a fine line that you have to walk between referencing that material and then simply just uh, repeating yourself, right? Oh, we're going to do this again. It's, you know, it's another helmet with spikes. So it's another helmet with spikes. Another, you always have to find ways to make it fresh, some, some small thing to make it seem new. Um, during the, uh, when we were all playing, uh, before we actually got onto the stream, there was some conversation about the enclave items on the, in the atom shop and, mm. uh, how there was, they're kind of callbacks to some very early art that showed up in, in fallout one, uh, with enclave stuff in the bunker, I believe in the, um, what was it? The master's bunker or no, it was, a uh, no, no. What, uh, was it, uh, Oregon, Oregon's bunker? Was yeah, that it was actually that uh, that kind of uh, that enclave base uh, right. that you find Frank Horgan in? Yeah, Frank Horgan, right? Yeah, and mm -hmm. um, how that was uh, a reference, and and that's that's really cool. I guess that's a representation of kind of pulling these uh, references from previous work and bringing them back and kind of redoing them. W would you would you say that that's kind of an example? Sure. Yeah, you know, especially with the atomic shop, uh, one of the challenges is to introduce these these new things that'll that'll enrich players' experiences, uh, get them to be able to play how they feel like they want to play the game, but also not conflict with lore, right? So, t it, looking at the timeline and the continuity, you know, Frank Horrigan can possibly exist, right, in '76, but we can reference some of the shapes and some of the language that was going on with with the power armor and kind of reimagine something different but that is still very much enclave and so that same uh sort of uh mentality applied to the power armor and to the to the turrets uh to the to the laser field doors right this is this is what they would look like if 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 the enclave had those and, and keeping it nice and consistent um yeah. from, from that fallout on up to where we are now yeah. Yeah. It would it would make sense that the enclave would be uh into a certain kind of design aesthetic, even if it, things were kind of, you know, from a different time period. It it would still make sense that they would like a certain aesthetic. So Sure, uh, yeah. Yeah, en Enclave should look very, you know, very engineered, uh even almost manufactured, a little a little higher tech than than other things you might find in the world. Right? The the shapes for the enclave things, they won't be so simple. They'll be uh, they'll have a little bit more complex silhouettes to them. It just makes them stand out from like Brotherhood of Steel items, right? Or even, yeah. uh, or even items like that you'd find with uh, Carl's fellow settlers. <laughs> uh, the the blue. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The actual settler. I thought you meant the Blue Ridge. Mm -hmm. I was going to say. <laughs> it's the small things that, in culmination, you see them all at once. It's what makes the enclave enclave. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like it, um, they had more sophistication around the design than being kind of hodgepodge together out in the wasteland. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So from a, from your perspective, what getting back to your role, what, what do you consider an art director's position? Like what, what do you do as the art director? Well, I mean, you know what, exactly what an art director is, it, it kind of depends on, on the studio that you're in, right? It's like these, these titles, they, they, they mean different things in, in different studios. Um, so, uh, for, for an art director on the, on Fallout 76, um, I suppose what that means is, uh, you know, of course, uh, you are, you're working with designers, right? To expand the game, expand the lore while still making sure that, uh, we maintain a visual cohesion with, with, uh, with the fallout universe. We don't stray too far out. Right. Um, me specifically, you know, I, I do that. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to theme, uh, the atomic shop, the weeks for the atomic shop. Uh, I'm able to contribute a lot of ideas for the items that go in for those weeks and, and work with animators and designers and, and fleshing those out more fully. Um, and, you know, it's kind of one of the unique things I think about working for Bethesda, and it's kind of why I, I touched on the role being different in different studios with Bethesda, you know, it's, it's, it's such a creative and organic uh, experience making these games that people, people don't need to feel like they are kind of pigeonholed into a specific role. You know, you can, you can, you can write things, you, you can suggest things to artists, you can, you can take on things that you may not uh, have access to in, in, in other studios and contribute. So, so I don't know if that answers your question. I'm kind of, yeah. I'm kind of talking now, but yeah. I, do, I do need to, um, give a two year apology to one of our artists who came up with an excellent name for the weapon that, uh, that Graham uses. Um, he wanted to name it the Graham slam, which <laughs> in retrospect was an amazing name. Um, <laughs> that's an awesome and we really we really should add, add a legendary variant of it that's named that because uh <laughs> you know, speaking of, of writers uh or uh artists contributing in in other ways nice nice <laughs> so um so what other things have you drawn inspiration from and, and your team uh when it comes to things like um uh local history around west virginia or some of the weapons or um, some of the things uh, around even Night of the Moth, like uh, are there are there specific? Uh, uh, can you think of specific examples of some of the, you know, some of the local flavor or some of the local, you know, historical bits that you've kind of pulled history like inspiration from? Just for for Carl or or for myself? For you, for John, for for the oh uh, well art inspiration. Yeah, so of course, you know, first thing is is of course steeping yourself in the, the Fallout lore so that you understand where all these all these things came from. Uh, on a personal level, I love movies. I love watching films. I watch tons of films every week, and it, the older the better, right? So forties, fifties, um, and so I'll I'll sometimes be watching those and just sort of get, hey, that's kind of neat. What would happen if that was placed in a post apocalyptic? universe like fallout how would that how would that change um you know for for carl's carl's event uh amazon's got some cool uh documentaries on the mothman get on there and, and you know watch those and kind of learn what the history is with the legend and that prompts ideas as well so um i think i think kind of a sort of a, an open-ended answer to your question is you just gotta keep eyes open, and because you never know where you're gonna get the inspiration from, uh, it could really, could really be anything. Yeah. So you kind of just keep keep the feelers open, just kind of pull from everywhere. I, oh yeah, and keep it open. Yeah. yeah. What about? Uh, so do you look at West Virginia history as well with uh, the Appalachia Thunderpipe, Appalachian Thunderpipe, rather? Um, apple at you. Like, gonna throw an apple at you. Dave corrected me several times in the first episode of our podcast. I called it Appalachia, and I was corrected I, quickly. Um, but like the the Appalachian Thunderpipe um, is a great design. Um, do you look at you know Civil War era kind of things to to shape some of your designs? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of delving into into the history of, of West Virginia, um, looking into like Civil War era designs, like uh, the like the cart mounted, you know, Gatlin guns in, in, in the case of this this uh, weapon, merging those with our our handheld uh, crank Gatlin gun and, and seeing what comes out of that just through you know, just through experimenting. Hey, what would this look like? And then sort of previewing it in 3D if we want to take it any further so uh yeah just sort of yes it's kind of kind of a collage of of ideas and and tidbits of history and, and bits of the game and kind of mix them up and see what comes out yeah i mean it, it goes the same for the content we write to um you know we uh we have a big kind of master list of uh holidays and kind of special events that are specific to West Virginia, and whenever it comes time to start thinking through ideas, we kind of we go back to that. I mean, um, I, I don't know if any how many people knew what Foschnacht was before <laughs> '76. I know I certainly didn't. Um, I think but, a heck of a lot more people know now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's a good chance of that. But you know, there there is a lot of unique culture um, it, from that that region. Um, so you know, we we um, try to sample that as much as we can. Now, I had uh, I had a question for John. So uh, I had a little LinkedIn lurk <laughs> because uh, I didn't know too much about your background. And uh, you wrote the initial script and storyboard and produced and directed the E3 2021 pit trailer from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And we know you cannot talk about that at all. But from an art <laughs> standpoint, uh, what is it like to revisit a classic Fallout location like the pit? Well, I mean, it's it's exciting and it's daunting at the same time, right? I mean, it was it was done so well and it and it resonated with fans uh, so deeply. You, you know, the first first impression is like, oh man, I hope we don't mess it up. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we not not that we would, but but it's you know it's very intimidating, uh, I suppose. And it's trying to f figure out what the what the core elements of uh, of that content was. What what are the things that that made that that the pit, you know, and, and sort of working that out with with the other disciplines to to come up with what we're doing? Is the pit some kind of concert venue? I don't. It's never heard of it. <laughs> that's a, that's my way of saying we're we're <laughs> we're probably not going to say anything else about the pit. Right. <laughs> like I totally understand the the like the human response of like oh this is a big big responsibility you're going to take it seriously right like oh you feel like you really got to do a good job with it That's i mean it kind of feels like that for everything we do right like it's it, fallout is has such a legacy to it uh you know both before the the modern games and and during it it's uh we never want to disappoint so it's a uh, you know yeah. it's always a high bar to live up to yeah well uh ken what do you what do you say we move on to some of the uh night of yeah, the yeah. questions let's do that I want to. I want to make sure that we get time to do that. So, um, can this is for either of you guys? Uh, let's just open up the questions with. First of all, what is the story of the Night of the Moth? What can you tell us about this? Sure. Uh, so uh, I mentioned this a little bit before when we we're playing through it, but uh, it is focusing on a new sub faction of the cultists that we call the Moth, the Wise Mothman's Enlightened. Um, they are. One of the reasons we went with that direction is that we wanted to keep the cultists that you encounter in West Virginia a hostile faction. We didn't want to kind of dance the line between sometimes you're helping them and sometimes you're murdering all of them. Um, so we, we wanted to go a route that still captured that kind of um, creepy, not quite trustworthy cult vibe um, while also presenting them in a manner that the player could walk up and have a conversation with them without uh, getting into a fight. Uh, but that had kind of led us down this route of being able to create um, a pretty interesting dynamic between the two different cults and their uh, and their um, their belief system. So the the wise Mothman, uh, the, the the enlightened, they don't see the Mothman as a god, which is you know a big part of what the cultists that are in the game right now. They always refer to him as holy Mothman, and they speak about him like some otherworldly presence. Uh, they see the Wise Moth Man as basically their guru. He's he's kind of their guy, uh, their guide to all things, to life, to wisdom. Um, and so we, we just started to really build characters around the difference in in that thought. 
um, that we have one section of people who saw, um, you know, the vision that that about the bombs, about what they call the flood. Uh, you know, they turned that into kind of a more manic and violent group of people, and then we have um, the enlightened who see themselves as a bit more uh, of the educated scholars of of the Mothman's teaching. So, kind of forget what the question was, but I hope that. Yeah, that addressed it. <laughs> no, that answers it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just that was, uh, you're having these divisions, and I, I, I'm mm -hmm. sure we're going to start to understand more of how those divisions are fleshed out, how they came about, um, you know, that kind of stuff as things continue to develop. Um, and as we read more into like the little, you know, drops of information in the story that we, you know, in the in the game that we pick up and, you know, dig into the lore of it, which is mm -hmm. the you know the juicy bits that I love to to dig into. Um, now, uh, this is one of those things that I, I, I've been wondering. Um, uh, Mothman stuff has been popular for a long time. You know, there's movies about the Mothman, and it's, it's one of those cultural lore things, especially in the United States, that we've all been familiar with for a few decades at least. Um, but when, when Fallout 76 started, we, we learned, oh, you're wor working cryptids in, and the Mothman was a big thing. But did the team, and did you guys in particular, know that it would become this popular? That I mean, th there are there are Fallout seventy six fans that go to like they they take pilgrimages <laughs> and p send pictures of the Mothman statues. But you know, they may actually be cultists. Like 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 yeah. this, this has become a very big thing. Did did you mm -hmm. really become this big? So I remember um, when I when I came into the project, the Mothman had been designed and implemented already by that point, um, and we were doing a play test for him. Uh, and it was where we were. We were uh, the the one of the engineers um, who worked on it had you know was designing the the pop up and disappear type mechanic, and we were play testing internally. And I, I remember saying, and I, I it was so arrogant of me as a person who just came in as like a brand new person, saying, "I think this character is going to be iconic for the series." I I so like I kind of patted myself on the back when it became popular. I was like, "I called it. I knew it." Because yeah. it, it's just such a great character. Like the the seventy six interpretation of him is such an awesome uh, character design. I've got the little. He's actually you might be able to see him right there. Um, so I was a, I was just as a uh, wonder filled fan playing the content and not being a part of it. I kind of felt like this guy's. It's going to be huge. He's so awesome. Um, but I unfortunately I can't really speak to the process of putting him in there. Um, or the, the, the thoughts on that, because when I came in, I was already gushing over him. So, <laughs> John, do you, do you have well, any thoughts? I don't think anybody knew that Mothman, well, Carl, that <laughs> anybody else knew that Mothman was going to be so popular. Um, it, you know, our, our fans love the Mothman. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it certainly resonates with them. Um, I, I hadn't heard too much about the Mothman before we had started 76 mm -hmm. um, but then you know started doing some research and watching some documentaries i was like wow this is this is a thing and you know the whole mothman festival and, and point pleasant it's really cool I uh so, yeah i think the fellow yeah. community too has really amplified how popular that cryptid was to begin with i mean i see so much fan art constantly on twitter from all over the world with like different interpretations of there's Mothman in like a suit in an anime style. There's like yeah. a, a chunky <laughs> fuzzy one, like in a comic drinking coffee. It's, it's, yeah. it's wild. I'm going to need somebody to send me some images. Cause uh, I'm not familiar with the anime Mothman. That is right up my alley. I follow them. Love the Mothman. Like it's a big thing over there now. It's like, yeah. Like the Japanese Fallout community, uh, the Fallout 76 community is huge and they do some crazy awesome fan art and camp builds. That's yeah, I love seeing it. what they do on Twitter. Yeah, it's, it's, insane. it's absolutely crazy. A lot of talent. It's really, mm -hmm. really, cool. really, really cool stuff. Um, so, okay. So g getting back to the lore stuff, I, I've got another lore question. I probably should have done this one next, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to do the popular Mothman one because I've just been wondering about that. But um, okay. So uh, it, speaking of the cult of the Mothman in the game, now we know that that, has evolved from a group of people who believed in like the creepy myth from of you know the prophetic you know vision and you know they were kind of pre-war right the origins of mm -hmm. the 
Yeah, from. they st- they started pre-war, and survivors are survived thanks to the, you know the vision that Brother Charles received. And mm-hmm. um, if that name Charles sounds familiar, there is a certain character uh, who is in the Mothman Equinox who happens to share that same name. Uh, so you know, there's uh, that said, you won't you won't get much out of him in terms of uh, dialogue, but. Uh, yeah, they they were a a pre war group um, that transcended into kind of that that found footage style of storytelling that we had at the beginning of Fallout seventy six, um, and then we internally were super excited when NPCs were introduced to be able to see actual cultists in game as well and to see how they kind of changed over the the twenty five years since the the uh, yeah. the bomb strap. Yeah, yeah, and so that's where that's where my question is going. It's like over that time, they went from just being kind of this creepy, you know, they just believed in this kind of myth, kind of uh, 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 not particularly dangerous group of people who just believed in this thing, to becoming much more extremist and dangerous, like so many things do in the wasteland. Right? Was there a specific event or something that led to that or was it just the time and the dangerous qualities of the wasteland that just kind of kind of led people to become more extreme well i i've got my own theories um but the, th- the thing about that's interesting about writing lore um is that often it's collaborative um and sometimes that collaboration is by accident even there's you're, you're writing one thing and it happens to mesh up against something else that some someone else has written um, so for me, the the you know my major impact on the lore is this this new edition of the Enlightened, and so I explored back into some of the earlier kind of ideas that were happening and and the the earlier uh, arguments between them to kind of create this new sub faction of it. Uh, but I I would not be the the source of information on the the hostile cultists. See. Um, the ones that we we fight throughout Appalachia. There's a ton of great lore there, um, and great minds behind it. Um, so this is, in some ways, this was uh, a way of introducing the cult element without, um, I think, giving up, giving away too much of what makes them mysterious and interesting, um, while still kind of you know letting you. Would, uh, were there, is there a jelly bean situation? At, do we have to spin for a no, donation? No, no, you guys keep going. I got a, a Sage, shout out for the donation. I had to do the jelly bean spin because we got a donation. So okay. I've landed on coconut or spoiled milk, and I know it's going to be something awful. Yep, fingers crossed on spoiled milk. Oh, boy. Mm. It's not looking great. Anyway. I wasn't uh, disappointed. Okay. Thank you, Sage. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah. There, there is history for sure. There is a, there is a lot written that's in game. There's a lot written that's out of game, um, and you know, it's not, it's not something that I think. Even if I did have all the answers, I'd still hesitate to, to bring it all in because there's, a, there's a certain level of mystery that makes that kind of content so interesting, um, and yeah. you know, we, we try to keep that in there as much as we can. Yeah, I right. remember last year when we had uh, Ferret on here. Um, that was something that he said. You know, a lot of the times. He knows in his head what the full story is, but he'll purposely delete things because he likes that mystery to exist so that we think mm-hmm. about it and conjecture and come up with our own stories and lore and that kind of thing. Absolutely. And sometimes it, we, it ends up going in exactly the way you thought from the very beginning. Um, and sometimes uh, the f- even fans' kind of participation in that story will start to let it grow and evolve in different ways. Um, I think the the popularity in general of cultists exceeded, I think, our expectations. So, you know, the fan desire to see more of that is why we did something like Mothman Equinox. Is it? It came from that desire to want to participate in that more. Yeah, people like the creepy stuff. Creepy yeah. stuff is good. Yeah. yeah like creepy creepy stuff. Is good. Now, speaking speaking about prophecy and Mothman, and uh, maybe there's nothing you can tell us about it. Maybe maybe things haven't been written yet. But is there something that the wise Mothman is trying to warn us about? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> I can summarize that as there's many things he's trying to warn us about. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, I, I will say that in general, uh, he is communicating for a purpose. There's a reason he lands and he wants to, to talk to us. Now, I don't want to get anybody's hopes up. That doesn't mean you're ever going to know what that is or we're ever going to explore that. 
But those are the types of thoughts we keep in the back of our head is like the motivations are a huge part of how we write a character. And a lot of the times you will never even know what those motivations were. Maybe a character has a sister that we never even talk about as an, no, the, the Mothman does not have a sister. I'm sorry. But <laughs> shrubbery. He's yeah. just <laughs> and just want a nice little hedge. Right. Recovery. But yeah. in terms of what, you know, when we're thinking about, okay, what are some of the things that maybe these characters feel like they've heard from the Mothman? We start with, well, what is the Mothman actually trying to tell them? Um, but I, I don't want that to seem like that's some big, like, teaser for future content or anything. It's just yeah. the answer is yes. We, the, <laughs> we know what the Mothman was trying to tell them. That doesn't, that doesn't mean the players are ever going to find out. Probably. Um, Yep. But there, there's some there's some little hints sprinkled throughout for some smaller elements. Um, I'll say that uh, you know certain characters may have heard certain things from him that are more true than others, or their interpretations of it um, are uh, are incorrect in many ways. Do you know what my theory has always been? What's that? When we first emerge from the vault, he's watching us but doesn't touch us. It's when mm -hmm. we start doing things in the world and and killing creatures and you know possibly nuking the world space that he gets a little cranky he's mother nature's wrath so i'm thinking <laughs> i'm thinking that he's he's watching what we're doing and oftentimes he's not satisfied with what we're doing and that's we should hard. we should yeah, uh, that kind of speculation you know that i think that's the power of shrouding something in mystery like that right you know? and, and we should clarify the difference too between the mothman uh the red-eyed mothman the yeah. Um, the more standard, you know, version of it, and the wise Mothman as a as a separate character, and you know, their what are their origins? How did they come to be? Maybe we know, um, you know, but it's not the not the type of thing we explore yet, or ever. Yeah. Ken, did you have any questions that you wanted to get to before we? I know we only have so much time, but yeah, we, we had a, a a particularly one of the things that we wanted to talk about was uh, so the Blue Ridge Caravan Company that uh, that Carl you had quite a lot to do with. We wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, so you were the primary designer for that. It has a lot of memorable characters, um, most notably Ares. For people who maybe um, did the event but maybe didn't pay attention to the lore and backstory, how did the Caravan Company form? Oh, the, the so um, the, yes, that is in the lore. So this is not um, head canon or speculation. Uh, but they were formed out of um, Joanna Mayfield, who is who was running a inherited uh, trucking company pre-war, um, and their tr the trucking company was just called the Blue Ridge Trucking Company, um, and it ran trucks up and down the Blue Ridge Highway and all over the Appalachia region. Uh, Post-war, as a, a um, business first person, uh, Joanna turned that business into a Brahmin shipping company instead, put the cargo on the back of Brahmins and tried to continue uh, kind of life as, as she knew it before uh, the bombs. And the company and the organization kind of grew around that. It, it ends up becoming more of a um, protection company than it is a shipping company. They they provide uh, protection for traders that are trying to sell their wares throughout the region. Um, so a lot of the characters who are actually B Blue Ridge are the guards themselves, um, Ares being one of them, but there's a handful of others, such as Tommy Tentos of, uh, of the uh, Weekend Vendor fame. Uh, but or it's not Weekend, I'm sorry. It's... Wednesday. When does Minerva show up? It's been a while since I got to get Minerva deals. Anyway, players know. Yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> Yell in chat if you know. <laughs> yes, yes. So that I can actually get some new deals from Minerva. Uh, but they're they're more of um, you know hired help to uh, fight off the baddies as you're uh, as they're shipping goods across the wasteland. I love that group. I, I, that's been one of my favorite groups in 76, the Blue Ridge Caravan. It feels so, like I get it, it feels so believable in a, a post-apocalyptic world. In no small part because of its logo. It has such a good logo. Um, just <laughs> when I first saw it, I was like, this is a, this looks like a um, organic coffee bean company <laughs> that I would buy. It looks, it looks great, but. Uh, Best part of waking up is Blue Ridge in your cup. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, nice. yeah. It looks like you have a T-shirt with it on there. Like, yeah, yeah. Who is Aries? Who is Aries? That's a good question. Um, so I mentioned before that sometimes you, 
uh, you write something and you know the full story in your head um, ahead of that content going into the game. Um, and then sometimes that content gets to go into the game. Uh, and that is the case with Ares. Uh, this is a spoiler um, for Steel Rain uh, and for certain other pieces of content. But he is the character Calvin Van Lowe. Um, a lot of players have figured this out already. The wiki, I mean, you can't even go to Ares' page without it just redirecting you to Calvin Van Lowe at this point. Um, so I think it, it's it's pretty widespread knowledge. But from the very beginning, we want it to, when when we put did the Lying Low storyline, we originally had Calvin die, at, be dead at the end of it. You find Calvin's corpse. And we wanted to try to have a story that did not end, you know, with you discovering that the character you've been listening to on the holotapes has died. Um both out of just having a, a different kind of resolution than other content that we had already done, but also just to, to leave some air of mystery to it. So it was really gratifying for me to finally get to reveal that, hey, this character weirdo in the mask Ares, he's also this character from this, uh, this earlier content that came out. Yeah, it must be, uh, was it something that, that you, that you uh, had an idea in terms of bridging the Wastelander story into this? and using him as kind of a bridging character? I'd say it was more of a now or never uh, type of thing. It's, uh, it was the same thing with, with um, even introducing a character that was secretly him. Um, you know, he, I, I, I had never necessarily anticipated that he would be a caravan guard as the, the job that he comes back into the game as, but I was already building Riding Shotgun, and I said, I need a group of characters. Here is, it's do this now or do this never put the character in there and when it came to steel rain we had a point where we needed to be interacting um with settlers where it made sense that, it, that the blue ridge company was involved so i said now we could put aries in and why don't i just reveal it now because you know we're gonna the the focus will move on other characters will be introduced so you you want to um to be able to give resolution to that story it's i say it's a it's a rare opportunity to get that chance to actually get the full thing uh in game rather than kind of staying as your own personal story. It's a great evolution, uh, evolution too, in terms of a, a character that we hear a lot about, uh, but don't get a chance to meet. So he gets this really interesting character arc in terms of how he started, what he went through and endured. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's interesting to see him as one of the few surviving characters that, uh, that you meet after all he went through. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, definitely uh, did did not think I was going to get the chance to do that. So I was very happy that I did. Oh, that's awesome. I think that's uh, Tom. Did you have any more questions? Uh, what else did I have in here? I know I had some others. Um, oh gosh, I don't remember which ones I put in. We have a big document full of all these questions, but uh. They all get jumbled into the same document. Which Maybe to uh, you guys. What's the, most no what's the most notable experience that's happened to you while playing Fallout 76? Wow. Stand out in your mind the most. Oh. Wow. Most notable experience. Well, I, I, I can share when the first thing that I was really the big, like this, this goes way back, but the first thing that was, and this isn't specific to an event in the game it was just the game itself um my wife and i when we first started dating uh one of the things that we bonded over was playing video games and we started dating 13 14 years ago and so fallout 3 was new early in our relationship and uh she liked playing video games too but she had never played any bethesda games and so i was able to introduce her to fallout and then I was playing Fallout, and then she was playing Fallout. I handed her the controller eventually. It became one of those things where she would help make the decisions, but I would play. And then eventually she was playing, and I was watching. And so she ended up playing, and then she ended up playing other Fallout games, and you know, New Vegas and Fallout 4. So when 76 came out, we actually got to play the game together. And so 76 became one of those games where it was just when it, when it came out, it was like, we're both in a Fallout game at the same time. This is amazing. You know, it was just like the, just the feeling of that was like, and it's not specific to a specific thing happening in the game. It was just being able to play in a Fallout game with my wife simultaneously was, was just, it, it wasn't something I ever expected to do. 
And so that was by itself an amazing thing. It's awesome. Yeah. For me, I've never played an online game of any kind in my entire life. <laughs> I've played a ton of PC games. Um, I've been a PC gamer since the, the mid-90s. Um, and when I first heard that, that 76 was an online game, my immediately thought was some of the YouTube videos I've seen about Call of Duty. And I tend to be a fairly casual player. Uh, at the end of my workday, I didn't want to, to go into a world and then like have a 12-year-old just yelling obscenities at me <laughs> to relax. But... Uh, I, hit home for me i think on the the second day when i was in game walking around and you know a, a lot of people coming to the game now won't ever experience the game the same way that we did in year one um with with no npcs and uh area chat always on so uh, area voice so um walking around i i heard you know someone talking in the distance and it becomes a question of, um, is this person going to shank me or could it be a friend? Um, which, which made it a very real experience for me. So I decided to hell with it. So I, I went over, um, we started talking and hanging out. Um, and that led to, to meeting more people and making friends. And um, amongst ourselves, we started role playing. Uh, we had a caravan company called the Appalachia Trading Company. And it was the same kind of thing where we, we we were more guards protecting travel routes. So we would role play in game, kind of walking routes, um, and that ended up inspiring what what became the story for the podcast. So I think for me, this game um, opened me up to connecting with people in a way that I never had before, in a way that really enriched my life, and I'll, I'm forever grateful for. I can talk about. Um, specifics um, when and this ha this has happened a few times when Wastelanders came out every time there's been a major update to the game where actual locations have changed and I've played enough to be familiar with the location and then to see the location actually shift as if time has passed and the world has changed um, that to me is very interesting every time especially when I'm not told ahead of time about what's going to change, uh, even in little ways. Rediscovering a world that I'm familiar with already, only to go back to a location and not know what's going to be changed, is I find is very interesting. Um, so if I could give my two cents to to two guys working on this game, it would be do things like that and don't tell us that they're coming. Um, yeah, because. That stuff is amazing. Like going to going uh, going to where the crash crash space station is, and then going. Oh, the raiders are going to build a base here, and then being expecting go find a raider base is cool because oh, now I get to explore a raider base, and there's going to be a bunch of stories and quests and things to explore here. I know that I'm going to get to experience that. That awesome. But then stumbling into a building nearby that I didn't know was going to be going to be changed, and all of a sudden there's differences there, and I didn't expect that. That's even cooler because I discovered it on my own, right? Because I because the people who've been playing this game have been playing it, so many of us, a long time. And we kind of know what every little shack looks like. We know what every little cave looks like. But it would be really cool to stumble into that little shack because we're just grinding. We're just trying to collect, you know, glue and then going, wait a minute, this door wasn't here before. <laughs> Yeah, like a, a fantastic example of what you guys did is when the the Van Lo quest line dropped um, and you were introducing the Sheep Squatch, the way in which it was slowly done with you stumbling on, you know, a pile of, of dead cow carcasses and then you hear something in your distance and you're like, what the hell is that? And then you meet yeah. the imposter and you're like, okay, where's the real deal? And then I remember the day that it dropped in game and everyone was freaking out online like oh my god it's real like look at this thing and we fought it and it was terrifying and the way in which that slowly evolved and we're looking for it but we can't find it was masterful beautifully done yeah i will say that was not an accident um that was really well planned out and i need to give a shout out to our level design team um we we tell really cool stories here at bethesda but 
some of the best stories, some of my favorite stories from past games have actually come from the level design team and that environmental storytelling. Um, it, we, it, our, our team does it like no one else. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and even in the single player games, the environmental storytelling and discovering things on my own are some of my favorite things to do in those games. So it, 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 just secret, secret updates, secret storytelling. Pipe is life. <laughs> Even just changing the location of stuff, you know, even if even if like on the next update, all of a sudden a place where I expect mole miners to be, they're scorched there. And now I'm wondering, why are there scorched here? There's always mole miners here. Like little things like that will get the community talking and wondering what's going on. Like we're school kids talking about the level warp we found in Mario level four two. you know, like <laughs> that kind of stuff like like it, it, it goes a long way because it just makes us start wondering about things. And I, like, man, mm, that we'll like, place a mug somewhere in the world on your behalf that will just be there now. And Tom will be uh, able to dedicate like three episodes to what is going on with the mug. <laughs> What's going on with the mug, or, or or just a robot that just wanders around with like a little banner, uh, like that just has something scrawled on it. Like people would be like. What does the little scrawled banner on this new robot wandering around the wasteland mean? Like little tiny little updates like that, Th like little things like that will go like will, a long, long way. And like, sometimes we'll 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 go crazy over things that may end up being nothing. And I feel like you guys just sit back and like look at these guys go. A great example of that is when the standing stones dropped, and and there are like uh, people in the army who who specialize in decrypting taking a look at the designs on the standing stones and saying, well, this, and, and maybe it, it aligns to different points of the map and we're going to find like that. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Or a radio that has like Morse code in it that translates into some cryptic message. That's just like barely translatable to something. That's a hint about some tiny little thing. And th the community would go nuts about it. And we would spend so much time trying to figure out what it is. We do. But like those tiny little things are probably not that hard to implement in a game in a tiny little patch, but would buy you so much actual attention from the community. Um, that's my two cents. Yeah, I will say it is. A, it's an amazing thing to put in effort to a, a two part massive storyline surrounding the Brotherhood of Steel only for most people to be talking about a pipe that's sticking out of the ground with a note <laughs> next <Yeah>. to it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. And, you know, and, and maybe maybe these little things lead up to the next big one, but like those little things are probably you know a fraction of the amount of time it takes to develop that big thing, but would go a long way to giving people something to you know invest their attention in. There literally so, now is a pipe is life uh, cult <laughs> group role players who that's that's all that they're about they're they they follow the way of the pipe and it, it's it's interesting <laughs> we have an awesome community yes <laughs> that we do yeah so that, oh. that's my but um yeah we we love what you guys do um we're you know we're always you know, I mean, I, if you can't tell, we're hanging on every little detail because we're just so excited about every little thing that comes out. So, and now I'm terrified about everything that I said during this. <laughs> <laughs> John laughs, knowing that I'm doomed coming out of this. <laughs> oh man, I've been chatting with Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome to talk with fellow gamers, especially you know gamers who love what what uh, what uh, the games that that we were privileged enough to make. You know, games games as a as a service, something ongoing, continuing, evolving the story. I think it's a very powerful uh, powerful tool, and it, it's it's great to be able to talk to to folks that enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, and this is a, a big pleasure for us too to get you know a little bit more insight into the the process, you know, the behind the scenes. So, mm -hmm. thanks for your time talking with us. Um, Andy, you have any other thoughts or questions? No, that was uh, that was it. the uh, The one thing I wanted to remind everybody while while we're still here, um, follow for hope is going all the way through next weekend. We have some really amazing programming coming up. Uh, We've got the Dweller Drop that we're going to be doing tomorrow night that Carl has competed in and actually kicked everybody's butt in. Uh, and I'm still convinced to this day that he used some kind of secret cheat code. 
um, did really okay. well there. You can't um, prove it. <laughs> we got a uh, very raidery thing to do, Carl. By the way, it's <laughs> a very raidery thing to do. <laughs> Carl's not going to be able to live that down now. Mm-mm. Uh, and then next week, really, the, the height of um, of Follow for Hope is going to be our live production of a Christmas Carol. Pete Hines is going to be joining us, uh, with as Jacob Marley, Wes Johnson as Ebenezer Scrooge, Jan Johns, Courtney Taylor, um. We've got just an entire roster of some amazing uh, Bethesda voice actors joining us for that. That will be next, uh, sorry, December 17th. Um, that'll be kicking off on, so definitely don't miss that. Um, we'll be going on here. Please support St. Jude. We are now, uh, since the start of the stream, we've crossed another mark. We are at uh, $45,267.54. We're almost halfway to our goal. And uh, really, this, this community has has really turned it up where we are now we've paid for two life-saving surgeries for kids through saint jude so the community is is literally funding life-saving surgery which is awesome that's amazing that's all we got yeah thank you guys for having me on here uh, thank you both so much for doing this